You are Locked On Buckeyes, your daily podcast on the Ohio State Buckeyes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Wednesday if you're on Locked On Wolverines. Happy Thursday if you are on Locked On Buckeyes. We are doing it, the crossover episode for not just the biggest game of the weekend. It's the biggest game of the year. It's the biggest game in all of sports. I don't want to hear it if you are a Tennessee fan, an Alabama fan, a Georgia fan. This is the game. That's why they call it the game. So I, I'm Isaiah Hole, host of Locked On Wolverines. Over to my left, that is Jay Stevens, the host of Locked On Buckeyes. We are going to get into the nitty-gritty of this game. We are going to be very cordial. There's going to be limited, but probably some screaming, uh, maybe a death threat or two, but it's going to be all in good fun. I'm just kidding. We're not even going to get into that far. That far, wow. See, that that was a Freudian slip there. Um, anyway, uh, let's let's get into it, Jay. So first and foremost... Uh, how are you feeling this week, uh, especially knowing kind of how things went last year? Or do you feel any different going into the week of the game this year compared to some of these previous years, considering that Ohio State has long uh, been able to dominate Michigan? Uh, but obviously these things are cyclical. They're not always going to just be one-sided. But uh, how do you feel going into it? Isaiah, first I want to say I'm glad to be with you talking and discussing the game. It's called the game for a reason. But my thoughts, and normally I am optimistic, not pessimistic, but my confidence, let's use that word, uh, going into this game, this might be the least confident I am about Ohio State going into the game as I've ever been in my life. Now, granted, I will take away the Luke Fickle year. That was one of the oddballs, so I'm going to take that out of there. Jim Trestle, Urban Meyer, Ryan Day, out of all those years, this is the least confident I have been going into the game against the Wolverines. Michigan's defense is really good. Their running backs win their one-two punch really good. Will they play? Will they not play? I don't know what's going to go on with the is Blake Corum's knee, the Heisman Trophy candidate that he is. Those guys make me less confident. Now, my confidence goes up when I realize who the quarterback is at Ohio State, who some of the running backs are at Ohio State, how the O-line has played. The defense has played way better. way it's crazy. It's crazy how much better they've gotten from year to year with just the coach and the players. I think it's a lot of experience as well. But my confidence level is it's not as high as normal. And I think that's a healthy spot for me for me right now to really have a proper perspective and respect for Michigan's football team, respect for what they have done. I say all the time, Isaiah, winning in college football is hard. People take it for granted and say, oh, Michigan has a Michigan had a weak schedule. Ohio State, the Big Ten, it's weak. It's hard winning football games week after week after mm-hmm. week. When you have to get up, you have to play maybe a lesser opponent. You may not want to be there. Ohio State when they play Northwestern. I guarantee a lot of those guys did not want to be there. But you have to get up. You have to play four quarters of football. And if you don't play good enough football to win, you're going to lose, have a loss. And then we're having different conversations that you and I have on our shows when both of the schools that we cover, they're undefeated. My confidence level is not as high as normal. It's the least it's ever been. But I still trust certain portions of the the Buckeyes team this weekend against Michigan uh, Saturday in the shoe. Now, as for me, my confidence level has certainly been shaken given kind of what happened against Illinois. Uh, I'm not talking about the final score. I don't really care about that. Uh, That game completely changed and uh, was kind of put on its head at the moment that Blake Corum went down with a knee injury. Uh, I I know both teams have a lot of significant injuries, but the most impactful that could happen for, uh, for Michigan is Blake Corum. It is not J.J. McCarthy. Michigan runs 70% of its offense through him, and now we don't know if he's going to play in the game, right? And if he does play, how effective will he be? How much uh, how much pain will he be in? I've heard conflicting reports. Uh, I haven't talked to anyone inside the program uh, this week about it, 
Uh, but I, I have talked to people who have, and there's been conflicting reports as to uh, the severity of his injury. Some say there's no way he plays. There's some that say there it's a hundred percent that he's definitely going to play. It's all about how effective he is going to be. Uh, I went into the, into the, the game last year with a level of confidence, but still expecting Ohio state to win. Uh, I had picked it. I had predicted that Michigan would win this game uh, well, well in the off season, certainly during the season, I think that Michigan's got uh, a type of scheme that is, as Joel Klatt put it, kind of built to beat mm -hmm. Ohio State. Uh, Klatt gave me a little pushback on, on that and, and just because I think he didn't want to uh, get the pushback from, uh, from, from fans down there in Columbus. But, uh, I mean, it's what he said, and I agree with him, in that uh, I, I do feel like Michigan schematically at the moment and as far as having that the toughness in the trenches and things of that nature. I think it is built to beat a team like Ohio state, but if you don't have your best offensive player and the guy who's really carried the load, uh, then suddenly things change. And the problem for Michigan is it has not diversified its offensive attack. It looked very diverse to begin the season in the non-conference schedule. Obviously those were three not good teams in the non-conference schedule, uh, but it kind of felt like, okay, they are building this. But once they got to the Penn State game, they went very one-dimensional. It was Blake Corum or bust for the most part. And now that you don't have him, uh, considering J.J. McCarthy has seemed to kind of regress uh, in in the, the most recent weeks, they, they seem to really try to get him going, starting with the Rutgers game. And it just did not work, which is kind of a 180 from what we saw even at the beginning of Big Ten conference play. I mean, he put the team on his back against Indiana when Indiana really loaded up against the run, uh, really was kind of stalling Blake Corum. And suddenly things are looking a little bit different for Michigan going into the game. I'm not saying Michigan can't win the game. Uh, they have been preparing all year long. Uh, they have been game planning for this game all throughout the season. That is a departure from how they normally operate under Jim Harbaugh. They have not been doing that. That is a different thing. And going to the press conferences this week, Jim Harbaugh, it, the way he spoke about Ohio State, normally it's it's a very somber, It's very this is a very good team, we're going to have to play at our best to beat them. The way he talked about C.J. Stroud and Marvin Harrison Jr. and some of those guys, it sounded like they were like it was like you know that you aren't the one coaching these players. You sound proud of the way that they're playing, which makes me think that they have some aces up their sleeve, and there's a level of confidence. But uh, I'm certainly shaken. I don't think that, uh, that it's anywhere close to a foregone conclusion either way. But right now, if I was to pick one team over the other, I think Ohio State despite the key injuries on both sides has more going for it. But what, what do you think as far as the injuries? What do you know as far as that's concerned, as far as the Buckeyes are concerned? That's exactly where I was going to go as well. You mentioned Blake Corum, the injury for Michigan. How about Ohio State where both of their top two running backs, Mayan Williams and Travion Henderson have been in and out of the, of the lineup. Henderson gets pulled from quite a few games. Mayan Williams a few games ago, a couple games ago, got pulled from a game the, the, injury, the injury bug has been on both of the running backs. Henderson's the one that I think is more of a – he was more of the hot commodity coming out of high school, the five-star recruit, got all the eyeballs uh, out of Virginia. He was crazy on the field. Something has not translated from high school to college. I don't know what it is. Could be the speed. Could be the physicality. I, it could be a, a number of things, but something has not translated. So those injuries there, as Mayan Williams healthy, as Trav Travion Henderson healthy, that's something I always say is TBD to be determined. Because as you know, with Michigan, Ohio State's the same way. They're not going to really talk about injuries, especially this week. They want to keep those things close in-house. And then Saturday before the game, you get the list of players that won't play. And that may be crazy this weekend because they may have 10 guys that are game time decisions just because they don't want to tip off and let Michigan know a lot of what's going on. Those are a couple injuries there. My guess, though, is uh, two freshman running back down Hayden. He needs to anyway replace and get all of Travion Henderson's snaps. So if it's Henderson's number, just put Hayden in there. It should be Mayan Williams, Dallin Hayden, the one-two punch there. But then you have an injury at right guard with Matt Jones. And I, th I think that's huge and maybe not being talked about a lot by a lot of people because if you have an injury at right guard and your backup doesn't get many snaps there because he's a backup for a reason, how do you replace that? Do, do you move Paris Johnson Jr. to right guard and 
move Dewan Jones to left tackle and put in like what do you do? Well, Paris Johnson Jr. played right guard last year, but we all know his best position is left tackle. So how in the world do you fix that? The injuries at running back, I think there's a fix there. The biggest non-fix that I fix that I don't know right now is to right guard. You mentioned the best playmaker, best player, Blake Corn from Michigan. Well, coming into the season, the best playmaker for Ohio State was Jackson Smith and Jigba. He has only played in three games. Most recently, the Iowa game, which was, I believe, the week before Halloween. So think about how long ago that was. He was he came back against Toledo, uh, came, played a little bit against Iowa, left due to a hamstring injury, nagging hamstring injury that's kept him out of the of off the field all season, most of the season. But then here comes Marvin Harrison Jr. doing things that I even think his dad marvels at because his son's body control and uh, just the ability, his hands and uh, it's like glue. The ball gets there, it's like glue. It just it just sticks. That's the thing there when you don't have a guy in Jigba who he wants payback. He wants to play this game because of what happened last year. You have a guy, Marvin Harrison Jr., who steps up and becomes a phenomenal playmaker and wide receiver for Ohio State. Well, we, we're going to move on. I do have a, a quick, uh, a, a quick, quick note. Fun fact. And a lot of people probably don't know this. I, I know this through a, a couple of sources, and it's it's kind of ironic in a lot of ways. Uh, Ohio State wanted Donovan Edwards as their main running back, number one, in that uh, 2021 recruiting class. Michigan wanted Travion Henderson mo in the most. Michigan actually went so far as barely recruiting Donovan Edwards, and he was a strong Ohio State lean. He had to be talked out of committing a couple times. And uh, it's funny that they both got the other guy. So yeah. it's it's funny how that works. But we are going to – I want to. I do want to talk about the Jackson Smith and Jigba factor. I have uh, a note about Ohio State's offense as far as it pertains to Jackson Smith and Jigba uh, that I want to get into here in just a moment. But this Locked On crossover is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. These days – Every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Just as much as you are looking for your team, whether it be Michigan or Ohio State, to have those right players to be able to help them win the game, that's what LinkedIn Jobs helps you do for your business. It is so easy to create a post on LinkedIn Jobs. You go, you go on there. You just do it real fast. It takes just a matter of moments. And then you add your job. Add the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you are hiring simple tools like screening questions. Make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why by small businesses ranked LinkedIn Jobs, number one, in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to, and they do it faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash college. That's LinkedIn.com slash college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. All right, Jay, I, I do have a, uh, a note uh, of, that I kind of unearthed. Uh, I'm sure it's been unearthed by many, uh, but... Uh, I think when I think when you look at this game, and I do want to momentarily hear uh, what your keys are, uh, what what your big matchup uh, is that is important, uh, the most important. But I have my eye on this Michigan defense versus Ohio State offense. I think that is the game. Uh, I, we talk so much about Blake Corum. I don't think that that. I think Michigan's offense is okay, and I think it, but I think it will find ways. Uh, I don't think it's going to be as much that as it is the other side of the ball. But when I look at the Jackson Smith and Jigba injury, uh, what he's really the missing piece to this Ohio State offense overall. Because when you look back to last year, he had 1,600 yards. Then you had Garrett Wilson with 1,000 and Chris Olave with 900. Now, obviously, those are just, you know, rounded up or down there. Uh, but uh, it's when you look at the team this year, the leading receiver is Marvin Harrison with 1,000. The second leading receiver is Mbeka, Mbeka Mbuka, and he's got 900. So you are missing 
1,600 yards of offense. Because the next one but this year beneath those guys, uh, I believe, is Cade Stover. No, it's Julian Fleming at 419 or so, and then and then Cade Stover. You looked last year, it was a similar drop-off uh, between uh, b- b- from uh, going from o- Olave to the next leading receiver. So they're literally missing that production in the pass game. That that I think is a huge difference. So when I look at this game, the most important aspect is what Michigan's defense is able to do against Ohio State's offense. Because if Michigan's defense can stall them, uh, I, I think that 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 is what gives Michigan a path to victory. Less so what Michigan does offensively. Uh, what are your thoughts? What is is there a particular matchup? I know that was a broad, you know, unit versus unit as far as overall. Uh, but is there a is there a more condensed unit versus unit? Is there are you looking more broadly? What what do you think as far as where this game is decided? It's kind of cliche. You might want to say what I'm what's going to come out of my mouth and do the speakers. But it's, it's, it's me and everybody at Locked on Buckeyes here just all the time. You win games like this in the trenches. So I don't know if it's Ohio State's O-line versus Michigan's D-line or Ohio State's D-line versus Michigan's O-line. It doesn't really matter. I think it's all going to be won in the battle in the trenches, and everybody knows in this game, generally the team that has more rushing yards wins the game. Like, we remember how we saw it happen last year. Uh, people don't like Hassan Haskins. They they don't like how he celebrated. I mean, hey, he he was phenomenal. I'm not going to lie to you. He was phenomenal in the game. And who won the battle in the trenches last year? The Michigan Wolverines. And we saw the outcome of that game. I do believe it's it's that simple. But it's also going to take a lot of good coaching and strategically for Ohio State's O line coach Justin Fry. How does he? Who does he replace and how does he replace Matt Jones at right guard if he cannot play on defense? Who, what is what is the rotation on the D-line and how do you attempt to slow down anything Michigan does on offense? Hey, no matter who's back, they're going, they're going to try and run the ball. Like, that's not that's not anything that I think is going to be crazy. They're going to try to run the ball. Well, you got to figure out how do you slow that and win the battle in the trenches. You go offense, defense, one side versus the other. I go right back to where it all starts. If Ohio State loses the battle in the trenches two years in a row, I do believe they will lose this game. And, buddy, that's a conversation I don't want to have about Ryan Day and what this means for his career and tenure so far as Ohio State's head coach. See, I I, I, I actually, in weird ways, am, am disinclined to agree with you on this because I do think Michigan will win the battle of the trenches regardless. I don't think it's going to matter because, mm. in large part, what Ohio State presents in the passing game. I think that CJ Stroud, I, it, Michigan's going to try to move him, right? And yeah. I don't, we haven't seen Michigan be terribly successful uh, in the last couple games as far as getting to the quarterback. They did not get to Tommy DeVito uh, this past week. Uh, obviously, having the right guard out plays a big difference, especially uh, what when Ohio State wants to try to run. I think Michigan coming in with, uh, one of the best rushing defenses and certainly the best that Ohio state has seen uh, all year. I think Michigan will have a pretty good opportunity to stop the run. I think though, that it's still a very potent uh, passing game. And I'm not confident that Michigan's going to be able to get to CJ Stroud the way that Aiden Hutchinson and David Ajabo uh, were. I mean, Michigan's got is on pace to have more sacks this year than they did last year, but the last couple of weeks, they have not been able to get to the quarterback after really kind of looking very good throughout most of Big Ten season. On the other side, I do think Michigan's offensive line will do extremely well against the Ohio State defensive line. But again, Blake Corum, I, I, I don't think he's going to go personally, but it's I'm I'm seeing conflicting things that say he might go. He, he you know he just might it might just be a matter of pain management. Uh, Donovan Edwards, it sounds like he's going to go, but again, he's a guy who's been out for the last several weeks. Uh, I, I I don't I I could see a situation where Michigan gets the push up front, but it doesn't matter because they are out there running walk ons behind them because that's what ended up being the case in the second half against Illinois last week. If, and we saw how poorly that went as far as trying to run the football. 
Michigan needs to be able to run the football. Part of the thing that matters, I mean, one element of the equation is having that offensive line. I mean, this offensive line is playing better than it did last year when it won the Joe Moore Award. Uh, but I am not confident that they'll be able to run the ball. And J.J. McCarthy has shown me very little in terms of being able to throw the ball. Uh, that Michigan had to rely on the pass game to beat Illinois. It did work enough. But, man, there were some errant passes, a lot of drops. Michigan's receivers, I thought that was going to be the strength of the offense more than anything going into the season. And it has been the biggest disappointment in the offense. Uh, certainly that having Luke Schoonmaker back at tight end will help. Colston Loveland has really been coming on. There's, there are some things that they can use as mismatches, but if Michigan can't get its customary, essentially five yards a carry, I, I, I don't think it matters how, how much, uh, push they're getting up front. I think that they'll open up holes, but the problem is, is having a guy that doesn't have the vision that isn't accustomed to being in, into not even just a game like this, but any kind of game period, it, it really, really stymies Michigan's ability. Um, all right. So that's, that's where we're looking at as far as the, a little bit of macro and micro Jay, when, when you tell, tell me, uh, uh, give me one thing that you are most confident in going into the game and the one place you are least confident going into this game. Most confidence easy is Tommy Eichenberg. He has been a dog. He has been a player. He has been somebody that's uh, playing through. In, I mean, he's talking about battle warrior tested. He has injuries of his own, and I don't think anything's going to keep him out. Like, if he's able to move, able to run, able to play football, he's going to be out there playing in the game because it means that much to him. So I think Tommy Eichenberg's a guy I can lean on and trust. You mentioned the passing game, but what Ohio State can do there. One thing I am not confident in, is a third receiver at Ohio State. I got Marvin Harrison Jr. I got Emeka Abuka. Both Abuka was the leading receiver, uh, both receptions and yardage last week, I do believe. Marvin Harrison Jr. Um, is up for the Bolitnikoff semifinalist, semifinalist, I believe, for that award that goes to the best wide receiver in college football. That third wide receiver, though, Julian Fleming, I think you said he has like a, a little over 400 receiving yards on the season. Over the past few weeks, I don't know what's got doing, what happened. He can't get open, uh, dropping balls in uh, rainy and wet conditions, outside of rainy and wet conditions. It's just really weird to see. And I do think this is a game where you need a third receiver, especially when you know your one of your running backs is going to be playing. I think Dallin Hayden's going to be RB2, is going to be dealing with an injury. Mayan Williams. You need a third receiver. It's what makes Ryan Day's offense go. That third receiver is really tricky, and I don't know who it is. If it's Julian Fleming, I'm really, really, really nervous about what's going to happen if Stroud continually tries to target Fleming on the football field. Well, I'll be curious to see how Michigan handles that. Now, they've, they've, it, it's, it's an interesting thing when you look at Michigan's pass defense this year. Uh, they, they have been very shut down. I mean, again, this is, this is going to be the best pass defense, theoretically, that Ohio State has mm -hmm. seen mm -hmm. all year. Now, I, I say for both defenses, take things with a grain of salt, right? Because what powerful offenses has either team seen? Really right. none. So this th that will be an interesting dynamic uh, for, for both. But uh, because both offenses, theoretically, obviously Michigan being particularly hampered, losing 70% of its production in Blake Corum, potentially. Uh, but, you know, I, idealistically, these are the two best offenses and two best defenses that these teams will have seen. Uh, but we will obviously find out. But as far as Michigan is concerned, uh, the, the place where I am the most confident is in the run defense. Uh, that is what that, I know they gave up 140 yards to Chase Brown. They, they basically had uh, a couple. I, I would say they lapsed on about five plays in the third quarter. Uh, and otherwise they shut him down in the first, second and fourth. Uh, and, but Chase Brown, it, he, went into the game leading college football in total yards. It's not like he's just some guy out there and they still, you, you look and say, oh, they gave up 140 yards and that's not great. But I mean, against a guy like that, who is the bulk of the Illinois defense, that's honestly not that bad. The problem was the 37 yard touchdown, uh, especially with the right guard out for Ohio state. I think that that's 
that, you know, they're going to have to do something because Mozzie Smith is, he might not have the stats, but he is the tip of the spear, as Michigan mm -hmm. says, in the middle of that defense. And we've seen teams that average 150 some plus yards rush for about 50 against Michigan because they just absolutely shut down the run game. And that is what happened in the game last year. I'm sure that is a massive element. Now, I'll add a second big concern because we've already discussed Blake Corum, but the Michigan wide receivers, like I said before, that is the, the, the area which I thought was going to be the strongest on the team. I was more confident in the wide receivers than I was the offensive line in a lot of ways. And they have just been an utter disappointment in so many ways because uh, even when uh, when J.J. McCarthy, he who has been more errant in the last three weeks after being the most – accurate college football and uh, quarterback in college football in the first eight weeks. He has been relatively errant, uh, but when he has hit players in the hands, they're not coming down with them. Mm -hmm. Andrell Anthony completely, he dropped a touchdown against Illinois. Uh, he, he's had a couple where they're hitting him in the hands. Cornelius Johnson has been notorious this year. Uh, kind of what one of those guys where he drops two and then catches one big one. That kind of seems to be his MO. Uh, Roman Wilson has not been, he started the season looking like a, uh, like a diet version of Devonte Smith and got injured against Iowa with a concussion and has not been the same since we've seen him make some drops. Ronnie Bell, generally very surefire. We've seen him have some drops. If Michigan's going to win against Ohio state, as much as we talk about the running back situation, there can't, that can't happen. And I think harken back to the 2017 game. When things were still feeling, I mean, it, it wasn't quite out of hand. It was, you know, going into uh, halftime, I believe it was just a slight Ohio State advantage. Third quarter, Shea Patterson comes out. Or sorry, this is 2018. No, 2019, rather. 2019, Shea Patterson, he keeps on throwing to open receivers, guys who are wide open. And there were eight straight drops where he had hit guys in the hands. And they they weren't able to convert. Ohio State pulled away. Uh, so I think that Michigan's receiver play is a giant part of this game as far as Michigan's side of things. All right, let's uh, let's move on. Uh, we, we are going to give some predictions here momentarily. But first, betonline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there. From football to basketball to soccer and esports, we've got it all on betonline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, you can find all of those at Bet Online as well. We are always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fix. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, Jay, we've only got a couple minutes left here, so let's let's take a look, uh, a look at what we expect uh, for this game. Now, it is a home game for Ohio State. There is the revenge factor. Uh, Ryan Day said that he, you know, his team has felt scarred. Meanwhile, Michigan is ultra confident. They have this seem to be, I mean, even just by body language and all, and the way that their, their words are coming out, they do not seem phased by anything, whether it's the quorum injury you're playing on the road, all of that. How do you see this game unfolding? What, what, what do you expect to happen once we hit 12, 14 through this game's on Fox, so let's just go ahead and say once it ends at 8.30 p.m. <laughs> I love the sarcasm there. I expect this game to be a war. A war within the rule book. No, nobody's pulling out guns and knives, none of that crazy stuff. So you're saying like, Michigan State's not going to come and, and start playing in this game? No, sir. No, not at okay, all. Good. Not at all. Not at all. They are going to be somewhere else playing Mark basketball. Mark State from Michigan State. Cool. Good. Bingo. I do expect this game to be a war, and I do think it's going to be a game that both coaches have been preparing for since last year's game, honestly. Um, I do think that this year you can kind of see at times you may be saving yourself or not showing your full hand or trying things out to see if they work at the end of the season against the best team in your conference, but ultimately your arch rival trying to get for the Buckeyes regain bragging rights for the Wolverines to keep bragging rights. I think there may be a, a period in this game where Michigan is in the lead. I'm not going to say the Buckeyes will be up the entire game, 
I see Michigan possibly even coming out and scoring on in the first drive. My gut tells me, though, the running game of Ohio State and the defense of the Buckeyes will make plays late. Running game gets going in the third quarter, kind of continues to sustain drives and make lot drives, not so much three, four, five drives, uh, three, four, five plays, but eight, nine, 10, 11 play drives, which is not what you would think with CJ Stroud and a Ryan Day coach, uh, Ryan Day led offense. But sometimes you got to change things up because you want to make sure you win the game. And I think you're going to see that in this game. I think late, we've seen lately, the Buckeyes defense did it against Penn State, did it against Maryland. When you needed somebody to make a big play to extend a lead, the defense makes big plays. And I do think in the fourth quarter, probably last five minutes, somebody on defense is either going to have a strip sack or an interception or a fumble recovery, uh, take that thing back to the house, to the end zone. And I do think that's how the lead is extended there. I think this is going to also, going to also be one of those college football games we'll be talking about for a long time. Now, granted, I understand the injury situations for both teams. Throw those out the window. Throw all your excuses out the window. Those things don't matter. The ultimate goal for both teams is to win the game. And I think both teams, whoever plays, they're going to be ready to just go to battle and go to war. And I do think the Buckeyes end up winning this one um, because of a – well, they're already going to be in the lead. But I do think that the at a defensive touchdown late extends a lead and secures it for Ohio State. See, this is the type of game where I – normally I feel like I have a pretty good beat. If you were to ask me whether it's Michigan versus somebody or – I mean, really just in general college football, uh, I feel like you generally have – I generally have a good pulse of what each team is, what each game is going to be. I feel like every now and again, obviously, you get surprised, but uh, I, I find myself relatively difficult to surprise. Even last year with the way Michigan won against Ohio State – uh, I didn't predict Michigan to beat Ohio State, but I wasn't surprised, right? That was a game that went kind of how I expected it to. I just thought that Ohio State would still find a way. Um, this game, I don't have any – I don't think anything would surprise me. I don't think that there's any part of this game that would surprise me if anything happened. If Ohio State won by 30 points, I would not be surprised. If Michigan won by 30 points, I would not be surprised. If either team won close, I also would not be surprised. This is a game where I think anything can happen, and I think that is a rare, rare thing. Uh, and I think that just the injuries for both teams, uh, while I do think that the one particularly affects Michigan more, uh, I, I mean, the ones that Ohio State have can affect them just as much, yeah. Yeah. especially if Michigan feels like it does have some different things in its bag that it's been saving for this game with different personnel that don't involve Blake Corum. J.J. McCarthy has to be, for Michigan, has to look like he did for, I would say, 70% of the season. They have struggled with the deep ball all year, but at least with the short and intermediate stuff, he has to be able to go out there and, and do that. Michigan stopped the run pretty much all year with the exception of one quarter uh, in this uh in this last game, I know they had a, another game that's I'm kind of blanking on where uh, they did let up some runs. Uh, obviously, Penn State, they had one bust uh, with Sean Clifford, but generally Michigan has been able to go out there and stop the run. For me, it's it's all about which team establishes its style of play. If Michigan establishes its ball control, complementary football, the way that it plays, Michigan, without Blake Horham, should win. Ohio State goes out and, and establishes the uh, quasi air raid with a with a solid run game if they're able to run the ball and the defense is able to key in on you know Corum's either absence or limitations. Ohio State wins the game. Uh, I do think that Michigan will probably, like you said, score on its first drive. It's tended to do that against Ohio State, even when they haven't been very good. Even when John O'Corn was the quarterback, uh, which I mean, not great. Right. But uh, <laughs> they, they probably have some things dialed up and, and it's what happens from there. Uh, that said, I, I don't know what to expect, but I predicted in my write up to 11 Warriors that Ohio State will win 30 to 20. Uh, I, I just think that the injury issues that Michigan has are just way more difficult to overcome than for, for Ohio State. I think Ohio State live, lives and dies more so by the pass game than it does the run game. I, I think even having the, the banged up running backs, it's they've managed 
you know, despite that, you know, yeah. and uh, I, I'm not confident that Michigan can. I was give my score prediction here quickly. I didn't give it earlier, but I got, I've been saying all week, and even though that I am less than this, the least confident I've been in any Ohio State Michigan game, I still think the Buckeyes win this game. Really, it's the running game and the defense to me that, that get them to, uh, on the winning side of this contest 38 to 30. My gut says that's the highest number of points for Michigan in this game against Ohio State. But crazy things happen in rivalry games, which is why I think the Wolverines will be able to score a few more points than some people think they will be able to against Ohio State's defense. Because I just think something's crazy. I, I don't know. Something crazy just might happen in 30 points for the Wolverines is what my gut is saying. 38-30. I think it's going to be 31-30 in the fourth quarter. Um, a defensive touchdown late. Last five minutes of the game makes it 38-30. Um, and uh, the Buckeyes – get bragging rights again for another year. Um, that's just my gut, man. I know the, the rain favors Michigan. Not going to lie to you. Uh, seeing rain in, rain in the forecast does not make me uh, more confident. makes me less confident. But uh, the Buckeyes have found a way all year. Granted, Michigan's a different beast, a different animal. But they found a way. And something tells me Marvin Harrison Jr., Stroud, Mayan Williams, the guys on defense, they'll just find a way once again. It also helps, unfortunately, that Blake Corm is, to me, not going to play this game due to an injury that he suffered. Well, we will know more come Sunday morning at uh, at 4 a.m. when Fox is finished rolling all of their commercials. That's going to do it for us today for uh, Locked On Buckeyes. That's Jay Stevens. I'm Isaiah Hole from Locked On Wolverines. We will talk to you again soon. Thanks for watching and or listening. Peace.